That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Don't Worry Darling, the sophomore film directed by Olivia Wilde, which premiered at the 2022 Venice Film Festival, and Warner Brothers is releasing it September 23rd, 2022, amidst a flurry of tabloid fodder headlines. <laughs> Uh, what is Olivia's first film? Booksmart from 2019, which was fine. Was good. You saw this film at Venice mm -hmm. where Harry Styles spit on Chris Pine. What? I don't know. I didn't follow any of it. Um, there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes of the film, which I guess, don't worry, darling, the plot will not be remembered. <laughs> the drama will. Because Charlotte LaBeouf was in it and then he got let go for like weird conduct, right? I, I think they... Uh, it was like hostile, aggressive behavior, which, you know, has always kind of followed him, like Mia Wasikowska's stories on uh, the the Western, she, Lawless. And then Florence uh, Pugh didn't want to do press because Olivia Wilde was weird towards her? Yeah, in a nutshell, yes. Okay. And then Shia LaBeouf uh, released uh, texts and emails he exchanged with Olivia Wilde suggesting that he wasn't fired in those same emails. There was some potential uh, references to Florence Pugh that were demeaning on Olivia Wilde's part. Plus, she was married to Jason Sudeikis and both he and their children visited the set while this affair was beginning with you know, uh, Mr. Styles, and apparently that caused a lot of discord. It was shot during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it seems that Ms. Wilde thought that the rules didn't apply to her about social distancing uh, sometimes. Uh, again, like, all of that is completely separate, of course, from the reception and what the final product of the film is. But again, when you're talking about reception theory and what you know uh, and the baggage that you bring into a film's viewing experiences, you know, that does, uh, I think, infect how people sure. will, will view this film sure. and remember it. Uh, that said, it's it's a so-so film. It, it It is... It is the remake of The Stepford Wives that Frank Oz tried to make in 2004 with Nicole Kidman, but the studio kind of wouldn't allow him to do. Uh, and I remember people saying at that time that you can, take this, you can take The Stepford Wives out of the 70s, but you can't take the 70s out of The Stepford Wives. And this film feels very much like it's still in the clutches and the claws of kind of first wave feminism. And there, I, this is a spoiler heavy review, so if you haven't seen the film or don't want it ruined, please go watch it before listening to us. Uh, but once the, a pretty major twist is revealed, uh, it opens the door for all kinds of storytelling possibilities that this film really falls short of. Don't worry, darling. The basic story is 1950s. We're in this sort of like desert paradise where there's this private community of... People where all of the husbands work at the same com company called Victory. It's the Victory Project. The Victory Project. And all of the women stay at home and all they're worried about is shopping and cooking and looking pretty for their men. And it's made very clear these women shouldn't be asking about these men's work and definitely should never visit the work site. Because on their in their little community, like this big land, air, massive land... Uh, the corporate office is like right there. Uh, yeah, at, at a distance you can see it that the men drive off at, at like a compound uh, and it's suggested that they're working on because it's, you know, the 50s so uh, like nuclear uh, weaponry there's rumblings underneath the earth blah blah blah. So of course it begs the question what's going on at the Victory Project? The answer is nothing. The gag is it is not the 1950s it is present day and the founder of the Victory Project, Chris Pine, mm -hmm. has developed this technology that allows these people to live in like a virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So all of these men have their wives in this comatose state and their consciousness is being transferred to this virtual reality where these men can control these women. Okay, so there's Chris Pine as the founder. The main couple we're focused on is Florence Pugh and her husband, Harry Styles. Alice and Jack Chambers. And everything starts to unravel because Florence's character starts to realize like something in the milk ain't clean. Like she witnesses a plane crash, uh, which leads her to go to the headquarters. And when she gets close to it, she gets knocked back into her bed. Like her memory gets altered. She also witnesses one of her neighbors commit suicide and the way it's handled, she realizes something's not right. Margaret, played by Kiki Lane. Okay. So, 
um, at a point towards the end of the film, because of Florence looking into things and having a confrontation with Chris Pine, these men sort of like abduct her and take her back to reality. And that's when the audience realizes that all of this 1950s shit is like VR. And that really Florence Pugh's body is in this comatose state attached to some equipment in the real world. And we learn that she's actually a doctor in residency and her husband, Harry Styles, is kind of a big loser. Okay. So everything culminates after that with Florence ends up killing Harry Styles. But another character who's very important is Olivia Wilde because she is the only woman who is a part of this community who knows what's going on. Bunny. And the only reason she's agreed to live like this is because she's on some WandaVision shit where... Her children have died in the real world, so if she occupies this um, VR, she can be with her children. So she's willing to accept that. But when she sees that Florence kills Harry, we understand that if someone dies in the virtual reality, they die in the real world. So it's the husbands who take care of the wives, like when they're in this comatose state, they... I guess, feed them, clean them, whatever. So now that Harry's dead, if Florence doesn't get out of this reality, she will just be stuck there in like limbo. So then it's explained that if Florence can get back to like the Victory Project compound and exit through some portal, she'll be back in reality. And she does. So the end of the film is we see that she's, we, we, we hear do. her back in reality at the end. Mm -hmm. There you go. I didn't watch this thing. But... Please, go through your notes. What does V-I-C-T-O-R-Y spell, Jerry? Hobo camp. <laughs> <laughs> I'm illiterate. Uh, uh, there, okay, so what this film does have... That's a Strangers with Candy reference. Yes, for those my, my favorite... Know. Well, my second favorite episode. Uh, there's a, there are some things that are going forward. Namely, I think the Florence Pugh performance, uh, who's now the queen of the gaslights, I think, after Lady Macbeth and Midsummer, uh, who... Uh, very strong central performance uh, very likable easy to watch I, I did quite enjoy her I think the score by John Powell is also effective and it looks quite well how does well. Chris Pine look? he looks good is uh, his hair long like in Venice? no Oh. No, he has, he has short hair. He is effective I don't think they give uh, him any real range to kind of play with what this role should be but he does kind of have that Robert Mitchum Knight of the Hunter thing going as in he's a toxic person that you're also kind of it is also kind of uh, there's a gravitational pull there how does Harry Styles look Harry Styles is like DOA no screen presence whatsoever I thought just there's there's one scene where he gets promoted in the Victory Project where uh, it's his wife Alice is seen as not really supporting him because she's going through her own mental unraveling at this point uh, in the, in this virtual reality uh, and he does this like long tap dance song and dance number uh, that's a, right after Dita Von T shows up as a blonde to perform in this giant martini glass like uh, what's that Beyonce song nasty. Na yeah, nasty girl. <laughs> nasty girl. Uh, that's not the song, but like that music video. Uh, With Ursher. Yes, and that that really just kind of feels like well, once the reveal happens, like what was the point of that? But Chris Pine is fine. I also it, I think it's shot well uh, by Matthew Libatique, the uh, Darren Aronofsky uh, cinematographer who also shot The Whale at the same film festival that this premiered at. Um, yeah, so I, I think and I think I'm so familiar with Palm Springs though that it, it where it was shot. It, because we're not told it's Palm Springs. No. You just recognize that it is. Oh, yes. It's very distracting. Obvious, but yeah, I think it's distracting. Okay. But what's also distracting and what what made it not negated the sense of a twist at all for me is this is supposed to be 1950s America uh, and there's this desegregated community which is completely accepting of, of the black characters which uh, right away you should be like, oh, well. This you know, doesn't seem real. Something is wrong here. Um, but... Once the reveal happens is where I think the storytelling is really lazy. Uh, it was scripted by Katie Silverman, who wrote Booksmart for uh, Olivia Wilde, and also Carrie and Shane Van Dyke, uh, whose previous writing credits include Chernobyl Diaries. Uh, but this would have been a much more interesting tale, I think, from the perspective of anyone else. Uh, as in, what is the inherent self-loathing of uh, of a black person or a queer person that might want to uh, participate in what it was like when in this like make America great again mentality where there's this heteronormativity where women were enslaved and served the needs of their men? Uh, to me, that is the only interesting thing the approach that would be 
kind of covering new ground in this very familiar territory because what this essentially is is Ready Player One injected into the Stepford Wives. You said that in the real world, like Harry Styles' character looks bad. Like he has bad hair, bad skin. Yeah. And then in the VR, he looks like Harry Styles. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting because, you know, Harry Styles is good looking. Chris Pine's good looking. But then Nick Kroll's in the movie. Nick Kroll is playing bunnies. Uh, I feel like if I look like Nick Kroll, if I had VR capability, I would look like someone else. Yeah, see, again, there's, there's just... A, endless possibilities considering the technology that is the catalyst behind this this kind of community uh, that's enslaving women. I think Olivia Wilde gives herself the most interesting supporting character, but it's also a cliche. We've seen this before. There's a template laid down by Kathy Baker in Edward Scissorhands that is this character. Uh, but, but also, of course, the Paul Apprentice character from The Stepford Wives. Uh, and I think Wilde's performance while entertaining is also just Olivia Wilde. Like like that's how that's her persona off screen as well. I Harry think. Styles is in another movie, right? My Policeman, which uh, played at a different festival. At is TIFF. his acting better than that? I haven't seen that. Oh, you haven't? No, okay. Because I didn't go to TIFF. But I, I did read the book, which I'm uh, I'm very interested in seeing that that comes out next month. What else you got? This sounds like it's like an uh, uh, M. Night Shyamalan movie. Yes, I was gonna, that was my next thing. Like something like The Village, uh, the, that Shyamalan-y twist, uh, or Antebellum even. But again, those feel, you know, dealing with white flight and uh, the inherent uh, evil of racism in today's world and how it's married to the past, like those films are much, even The Village, I think, is grappling with that kind of sensibility in... Uh, uh, more interesting ways that I, I think than Don't Worry Darling is, which is just really heavily dependent on this gag that is kind of throwaway. Uh, I, the title is a throwback to kind of like lovely 50s noirs titles as well. Um, and their remakes like Farewell My Lovely, which was a remake of Murder My Sweet with Robert Mitchum or After Dark My Sweet, the James Foley film with uh, Rachel Ward. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Oh, and then the Olivia Wilde character, I think Bunny is very interesting is that she has this awareness because she's the only character, the only woman that smokes in this community. She's kind of gossipy and outspoken and, you know, the life of the party because she knows what's going on. But then she is that type of white woman that would just enslave her sisters. Uh, it, it, and again, I think that, th yeah, there are just so many... There's just so many missed opportunities, I think, with... Uh, but overall, for what it does have going forward, you could see a lot worse at the theater. What would you give it? Um, three out of five. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>